Dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to our 40th birthday FEAT conference in Munich. 40 years before, some people had the idea that also waste management and recycling activities should be coordinated on the European level, that we together would be stronger to represent the interests of our member companies. And if you see the fair in Munich, IFAT, you see also the results of your ideas, of your engagement, of your start of the cooperation. And it's a special welcome uh, to the past presidents of FEAT. I have the pleasure to welcome Keith Burry, Dominique Perrin, Michael Everill, and Norbert Redmann. A special applause for you. It's your work. As perhaps some of you know, we have a big industry fair in, in Germany called Hannover Messe. Um, the Hannover Messe this year takes place exactly in the time when IFAD is um, going on in Munich. And it's interesting to see that IFAD is today bigger than Hannover Messe, the big industry fair more exhibition space, more visitors, more exposition stands. That means the economy of tomorrow takes place here. And of course, we wish Hannover Mess all success, but the economy from tomorrow is defined and is developed here in Munich. I have the pleasure to welcome the Vice Ministry of Bulgaria. Mr. Nikolai Shitimov. Um, we are especially happy that you are here because the Munich traffic, traffic tried to avoid your participation here. Um, but you are here and, and we are happy about. And we also have the pleasure to hear a video message of the uh, Commissioner for Environmental, Mr. Shinkevicius. And then we have three interesting panels um, with some topics everyone here is interested in. So it's a, a kind of family meeting. It's a kind of coming together with old colleagues. It's also having a common look on the main issues our um, association is working with. I have the pleasure to introduce to you my successor, Claudia Menzi from Italy as president of FIAT from January on. And that's from my side. Uh, we start now with the video message of the commissioner. And then we have the pleasure to hear uh, the responsible ministry uh, minister of one of the interesting coming countries in the eastern, in the southeastern of Europe. I wish you an interesting conference. Thanks again for being here. Enjoy our meeting. Good morning, and thank you for this invitation. It is an honor to kick off the world's leading trade fair for environmental technologies. And congratulations to European Federation of Waste Management Industries at its 40th anniversary. The transition to a circular economy is an opportunity we cannot miss. We get the maximum value from the materials we use, we reuse and we recycle, keeping materials in the economic loop for as long as possible. It makes for an economy that's more sustainable. It's better for the planet, it's kinder to nature and it also means growth and jobs. That's why it's central pillar of the European Green Deal. A more circular economy is a prerequisite to achieving the European Green Deal objectives of reaching climate neutrality by 2050 and halting biodiversity loss. For this reason, we adopted in March 2020 the Circular Economy Action Plan, which is a key part of the European Green Deal. And one of its building blocks, the action plan leads towards a more resource efficient clean and climate neutral economy that gives to the planet more than it takes. We also work on mainstreaming the circular economy in other main policies and initiatives of the Green Deal, 
For example, the contribution of the circular economy is recognized in other strategies, such as the EU biodiversity strategy for 2030, the EU strategy for plastics and the zero pollution action plan. At the end of March this year, we adopted the most ambitious circular economy package to date, implementing the core vision of our action plan. It includes several flagships, such as the eco-design for sustainable products, regulation to make sustainable products the norm in the EU, the first EU strategy for sustainable and circular textiles, the revision of the construction products regulation and the initiative to empower consumers in the green transition, which will ensure better access to product information and protection against untrustworthy green claims. More than ever in these times of unprecedented challenge, we need innovation in environmental technologies to successfully achieve a circular economy in line with the Green Deal objectives. We also know that a circular economy creates additional value from and for EU industries, spurs new business opportunities and increases job creation. And indeed, the Circular Economy Action Plan recognizes the importance to harness the potential of innovation and the position of European businesses as frontrunners in circular innovation. In this perspective, the Action Plan puts forward several channels of support for the development and deployment of new environmental technologies. For instance, the European Regional Development Fund through smart specialization, the LIFE program and Horizon Europe provide opportunities for funding and support the whole innovation cycle to bring solutions to the market. In addition, the European Institute of Innovation and Technology coordinates initiatives on innovation for the circular economy within its knowledge and innovation communities in collaboration with industry, SMEs, universities and research organizations. To promote the development and uptake of green technologies, the Commission also runs the European Environmental Technology Verification Scheme, or ETV. Through ETV, companies with innovative environmental technologies can get their performance claims verified by independent third parties. That way, they enter the market with a competitive advantage and technological risk is reduced for purchasers and investors. But our work continues. Over the course of the year, we expect to adopt several initiatives to go further, for example, to continue accelerating the transition of the plastic sector towards more circularity. We will address the presence of microplastics in the environment and propose a policy framework for bio-based, compostable and biodegradable plastics. The best waste is the waste we don't create, the waste we avoid. The Commission is looking at targets for waste reduction, part of our efforts to increase waste prevention. Our overall goal is a significant reduction in total waste generation and halving the amount of non-recycled municipal waste by 2030. All member states should also be encouraging reuse and setting up of systems to promote reuse and repair. We are revising the legislation on batteries, packaging and end-of-life vehicles each time we focus on limiting waste creation and ensuring that inevitable waste is clean and easy to recycle. We have already very ambitious waste legislation in the EU with the highest ever targets on recycling. To reach the recycling targets, mechanical recycling is the primary treatment method. The quality of the input waste going to recycling is the key to ensure as little losses as possible and provide for secondary raw materials that have a high market value. A more performant recycling sector highly depends on a consistent supply of quality separately collected waste. Smarter and scaled up separate collections should be at the core of national and regional waste. Management planning and quality should be the driver throughout the whole collection sorting and recycling chain. That is why we are working on a set of harmonized rules for the EU to improve the separate collection systems and effective participation by citizens. But we see very slow progress from member states in updating their waste management plans to the new requirements of the 2018 Waste Framework Directive. There is a need for improvement if member states shall be able to make use of cohesion funding. The existence of updated plans is an enabling condition for such funding. This will be important in order to ensure that EU recycling capacities are developed and scaled up to meet the new recycling objectives as well as the overarching objective of the Green Deal for the EU to take charge of its waste. EU rules have also played a crucial role in improving the quality of rivers, lakes and seas on our continent, with a beneficial impact on European citizens' health and quality of life. However, progress has not been even in some member states. Wastewater infrastructure needs better planning and more financing. We will now do our utmost to drive innovation 
and new investments in environmental infrastructure everywhere in Europe. We are preparing to modernize the Urban Wastewater Treatment Directive with a proposal planned for adoption this year. And this proposal addresses remaining sources of urban pollution, including smaller agglomerations and rainwater, and improved treatment for nutrients and micropollutants. That will be an incentive for new technologies. It also focuses on transparency and governance, as well as alignment with the Green Deal beyond zero pollution, including for biodiversity, energy and climate. I wish you great success for this event, Trade Fear. Dear Mr. President, dear distinguished guests and colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, I will like first to extend sincere appreciation and gratitude to the European Waste Management Association President Mr. Peter Kurt for the excellent arrangement of the biannual conference of the 40th anniversary of the association. Also, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to be part of this event here at IFAT 2022. Over the years, Bulgarian recycling industry has come a long way, marked by the development of legislation with the introduction of European norms and goals, but also by various challenges on the market of secondary raw materials. Along with the market and legal challenges, from now we must strive to improve the image of recycling sector in Bulgaria. Bulgarian society needs to be aware that waste is not just raw materials and processing, but this is the heart of the entire sector of the economy which includes hundreds of companies, thousands of employees, and which creates great value, great added value. The free movement of raw material in order to fill the capacity of recycling company is also essential. Therefore, events like this one in IFAT as a whole are great importance for the business. The exchange of experience between countries and experts and the opportunity to discuss and present different technologies, facilities, the uh, and the necessity of dialogue and cooperation. This, in turn, is the basis for the development of the recycling sector in Bulgaria and the achievement of the national goals. Separate collection and recycling in Bulgaria remain the first priority in terms of achieving the already higher targets for packaging waste recycling. The Ministry of Environment works successfully with the recycling industry and in particular with the Bulgarian Recovery and Recycling Association. Currently in Bulgaria, with their help and participation, we are working on the integration of deposit system for some packaging waste. The Bulgarian Recovery and Recycling Association also contributes to the development of recycling industry in the country and the establishment of favorable environment for increasing foreign investments in this field. From now on, we need to make even more efforts to increase the share of recycle, recycled waste and, expand, and the expense of landfilling. Above all, however, we must work more intensively to change the consumer behavior and citizens' attitudes. The challenges of recent months have once again proved that only dialogue and cooperation between industries, business and citizens can guarantee the development and the achievement of common goals and the interest of society as a whole. Achieving the goal for wood packaging due to, to the very specific of this type of waste is a challenge. At the stage, we believe that the market conditions for paper prices and traditional uh, counterparties in the countries, as well the, as availability, available capacity in Bulgaria, will allow us to achieve the higher goal. In previous years, for this material, Bulgaria was achieved the result about 80%, equal to absolute value of the quantities greater than those in 2019. Perhaps the biggest challenge will be the new sp split target for metal packaging, in which separate recycling rate for aluminium packaging must be achieved. The European Green Deal focused on taking action to tackle environmental and climate issues, this ensuring a stable future 
for the generators for generations to come. Achieving climate neutrality for 2050 is a top priority. The transition to a circular, circular economy, which is one of the highlights of the pact, aims to strengthen the compet competitiveness of the economy and increase the GDP by 0.5% by 2030. Bulgaria puts the circular economy as a long-term priority of its development policy. The transition to a circular economy will provide economic growth and a better and healthy environment in Bulgaria. The necessary institutional, financial and human resources will be mobilized for, the, for that purpose. The development of innovation and particular eco-innovation is a key part of the concept of achieving circular economy. Once again, thank you for the invitation and the opportunity to participate in FEAD's conference, and I wish success to all participants. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Sitchimofen, for this picture of Bulgaria in waste management. Now I give the floor to one of the dream team that we have here this morning. The dream team that created, that founded uh, FIAT 40 years ago. Um, and uh, we give the floor to Keith Burry, which is one of the past presidents in, in the very beginning of FIAD. And that's a great pleasure and honor to have those past presidents that um, Peter could mention this morning. And uh, Keith, the floor is yours for a few minutes. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It was in 1984 that I first became involved with FIAT, some two years after FIAT was first launched. At that time, there were three member associations supporting the organization. BDE from Germany, FINAD from France, and the ESA from the UK. We had a very small management team comprising of Norbert Rethmann and Gustav Dieter Edelhoff uh, and myself. And um, we put our heads together to try and work out a solution. How can we build a European industry association? At that time, the administration of Fiat um, was undertaken by uh, BDE from the offices in uh, Cologne. The task before us was huge. How can we develop our business activity and become the recognized member within the European Union to represent our industry and our interests? In 1989, uh, we gained five new members from Spain, Italy, Belgium, the Netherlands and Luxembourg. Uh, but at that time too, it was clear that if FIAD was to become a self-sufficient organization, then we needed to have offices in Brussels and not in one of our uh, member country associations. And so this was agreed and this was funded primarily um, by Norba and uh, Gustav Dieter and my company. <laughs> and um, we had a, a meeting at Heathrow Airport one morning and I'm sure you remember and we, we sort of uh, tossed the coin and said okay Who's going to lead this? And we all said, we will. And we each put £10,000 into the pot to give Fiat its first uh, really fun. And uh, I remember that meeting uh, very well. At, um, so shortly after that, we, we set up our offices in, uh, in Brussels. We put together our own management team and we appointed um, uh, Dieter Voigt as our general um, manager. At that time in our history, as you can imagine, practices for the handling of waste were primarily very similar to what they are today. Collection, transportation, landfill, uh, waste to energy, some recycling, some composting, 
very little material recovery as we, uh, as we know materials recovery today. And at that time, the private sector in Europe handled 60% of the household waste that was generated and some 75% of the industrial and commercial waste that were generated within the EU. And this had a revenue value of circa something in the order of about 75 billion uh, euro. Competition, marketing and our public standing also form part of our platform for developing the, the FIAD uh, activity. From the 1990s onwards, the FIAD business activities grew uh, within the EU. The membership increased and we now have 19 uh, national member federations. In regard to the function and operation of the new legislation uh, with the harmonization of new standards, the introduction of new practices at process sites, these matters became a priority, which together with education and training of site operatives and the maintenance of our public image became important issues. The visibility of our industry to the public at large and to the EU and national legislators is a major feature which is promoted and maintained by FIAT. At the present time, from our head office in Brussels, the work of the management continues on behalf of our industry to ensure that members are kept informed of the changes in legislation that affect our businesses, matters concerning, for example, the shipment of waste, waste packaging, waste to energy, recycling of plastics and management of, uh, of waste plastics are all priority issues. And these are some of the activities currently under consideration in the EU Green Deal. And of course, there are uh, many more. We should always remember that the practices we pursue take place as a result of legislation which is enacted and that is an important role of FIAD is to have a common understanding with the legislators in regard to the, the introduction of new legislation, changes in practices and other aspects that have stood the test of time. I'm sure that in the discussions this morning, much will be said regarding the practices that are used and the impact and introduction of new technology and of new regulations. These will all affect the future direction of our business and the activities that we pursue. And I'm sure that the next 10 years has much to offer. And I wish you all well in the challenge that lies before you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Keith. I realize I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Valérie Plenmaison, Secretary General of FEAD, and my pleasure today to moderate this uh, conference. So now I invite the experts of the panel number one, uh, namely Mr. Katojvil, Mr. Kuhlmann, and Mr. Maurer to take place uh, on stage. Um, and um, um, Mr. Kratochvil is uh, ch vice chairman of the Czech Portable Battery Association and general manager of a company named EcoBat. Uh, Holger Kuhlmann Kul Kulman, sorry, uh, is working as a business manager bas battery recycling at BASF. And uh, Helmut Maurer um, is uh, working at the DG Environment, the Commission, uh, in the unit Sustainable Chemicals. Uh, I will set up the scene for one minute with a few slides, please. Yes, showing the main point for us in the waste management industry. We have a new regulatory framework from batteries coming soon, negotiated currently uh, at EU level, with uh, a lot on production of batteries, but also some pro provisions on waste management. The key point to us are in red, mandatory recycled content, high collection targets, and quicker, quick delegated acts to make it happen. The next slide show two key things. In the next 
before the next 10 years, the global battery demand in Europe to increase by 14. And the recycling lithium ion batteries uh, worldwide in 2030 should be by 2,600,000 uh, tons, from which Europe should do 20%. And the very next slide, which is the last one, shows that the capacities that we have in Europe, this is a table from some months ago, maybe it's not 100% updated, but this is the trend. We have capacities up to 20,000 million, uh, sorry, 20,000 tons for lithium ion batteries, and we need uh, 500,000. So there is a recycling capacity to be increased by, multiplied by 25 in less than 10 years. Uh, so this is the challenge, and this is also the case for other batteries. This is only an example. So I will give the floor after this brief introduction to Mr. Kratochil, he has a few slides to explain to us. Uh, please keep the clock, all of us. <laughs> One, two. Hello. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for introduction. And I would like to add uh, one more information that I am here as a representative of uh, Czech Circular Economy Association, which is a member of uh, FEAT. But I'm coming from a waste sector specialized on batteries. So can you, can you make the slide? Uh, I would like to introduce shortly the situation with the waste batteries in the Czech Republic. Next slide, please. So from the, from the beginning of last year, we had a new act uh, uh, which is focused on end of life products. Uh, so this, uh, this act uh, covers batteries, accumulators, electric and electronic equipment, and end of life uh, vehicles and tires. It doesn't mean that we started with collection of batteries last year because we had, we had this, uh, this topic was implemented in our waste act. So for instance, collection of batteries has a long tradition in the Czech Republic from 2002. Uh, uh, so, uh, from the name of the act, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's visible that uh, collection and recycling in the Czech Republic is strictly based on uh, producer, extended producer responsibility. And to, uh, to, to show you, uh, please can you, can you uh, go back? Yeah. No, no, no. Uh, back. Yeah. Uh, and you have the number of companies which are involved in, uh, in battery collection and uh, uh, and recycling for portable batteries it's more than uh, 2300 companies which put batteries on the market for industrial batteries it's uh, more than 300 companies for automotive batteries it's uh, 156 batteries next slide please uh, Collection of portable batteries has the longest tradition in the Czech Republic. We have two compliance organizations. Our organization is uh, the bigger and more important one. We started 20 years ago. Uh, we have uh, 22,000 collection points around the Czech Republic. Last year, we collect 2,000 tons of uh, portable batteries and we reached uh, uh, collection efficiency 48%. We are not happy that only 50% of the waste batteries which we collect uh, could be recycled uh, in our country. We, had, we have to export the batteries. For automotive and industrial batteries, the situation is uh, different because uh, most of companies which put these batteries on the market uh, inside electronics or cars, they uh, they prefer to, to solve it individually. It means that they are registered, but they have their individual plans, how to collect and how to recycle. 
ECOBOT itself uh, serves around uh, 115 clients. Uh, among them, there are some important uh, well-known names like Toyota Central Europe, Jung Heinrich, Linde, Toyota. Uh, we are happy with high efficiency and uh, with the situation of collection and recycling of lead acid batteries, you know, because collection efficiency is nearly uh, 100%. And, uh, uh, it's a very good example how we can use uh, recycled material for production of new batteries. We have only one recycling uh, facility in the Czech Republic, Kovoutě Příbram. They are focused on recycling of lead acid batteries, but they are active in developing new technologies for alkaline batteries. And from, the, uh, from this year, from uh, end of this year, they will start with the small scale recycling of lithium ion batteries. So it's uh, simply uh, what the situation is like in the Czech Republic. Thank you very much, Petr. What would be the main challenges in Czech Republic, in a few words, to improve the situation, to address? Okay. May I ask you, uh, challenges uh, is the last slide. Yeah. Uh, maybe you will be surprised uh, that for us today, uh, it's, uh, uh, these are frequent fire incidents. No matter of the size of the battery, you have fire incidents with button cell lithium batteries. You have incidents with large uh, batteries for electric buses, for instance. Everywhere in the Czech Republic, in Belgium, in Germany, so and uh, we have to we have to focus on safety of transportation storing and it uh, it increases costs significantly and um, that's an issue lack of recycling capacity for lithium ion batteries which are prevailing chemical type now uh, we have only few few facilities in europe but these recyclers they prefer to take uh, to take waste from from industry from production of new batteries and we are on the second place we who collect batteries because it's it's not so good material for them we are on the second place uh, maybe uh, question is about collection targets yeah we know that for portable batteries uh, the new legislation they will bring some increase in collection uh, uh, to target efficiency now it's 45 percent but it will be 65 percent 70 percent it's a big challenge for us and my question is is this reasonable to make these limits higher for portable batteries because 85 percent of portable batteries are represented by metals like zinc iron manganese these are not these critical metals which we will need for production new automotive batteries like cobalt lithium nickel for me much more reasonable is to establish collection target for instance for so-called batteries for light means of transportation typically e-bikes one example in last year in the Czech Republic, there were sold 120,000 e bikes. So it means uh, for the batteries, 500 tons of the batteries. But our collection last year was only 25 tons of batteries. So we are on the 5% collection rate for this special type of batteries. So please uh, take these details into mind to be more effective in settling new legislation. Thank you, Petr, for this uh, picture of the situation in Czech Republic. Um, I would like to ask Holger Kuhlmann how he reacts to this situation in Czech Republic with regard to the situation in your country, where it's a, an EU-wide uh, mark about the challenges and triggers. Uh, it's Okay. Um, what, what happened in, in, in Germany? Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, 
what's happening in Germany on the European regulation, what means the recycling efficiency or the, the new calculation for us. The collection rate will be a an, an very interesting part because on the other side we decided now to have an um, a part of recycling material in the new batteries. So we need a lot of batteries to get these part in the end of the day. Uh, we have no clear collection for industrial batteries. I think for household batteries, we have an, in all countries a, go, a good system for household batteries to, to get higher targets. What happened in the end of the day with the uh, industrial batteries? And one of the biggest challenges is we don't know what kind of lithium ion batteries will be in the future. So we have a lot of changes on the battery, battery material. Um, and this will be uh, one of our, our biggest challenge to find a efficiency recycling way for this material. Um, would you say, both of you, a few words of, on next steps uh, becoming <laughs> becoming oh. also critical with regard to methodologies, etc., monitoring? Yeah, this I, I regulation the, is not all. Yeah, the next steps um, also from the regulation side will be uh, to define how to calculate the recycling efficiency. Um, we decided to have an, an recycling efficiency by 70%, by 95%, may 85% for nickel, for cobalt and otherwise. Um, how to control this? Where, to start, where we start the recycling efficiency? At the collection point, at the, we are talking about black mass production, we are talking about hydrometallurgy, um, uh, chem material production. Um, what has happened with the, with the nickel? Who has reported this? Who has controlled this? Who has controlled the export? Is black mass, for example, is it a product? And is it 100% recycled? Or is it, uh, do you need the nickel or other parts? So uh, the next step must be to find a way how we calculate uh, the recycling efficiency and the recycling material. And we have to build up an uh, maybe also a collection rate um, for industrial batteries. We are only talking about a collection rate for household batteries, but we have no collection rate inside the, uh, the paper for industrial batteries. Okay, <clears throat> thank you. Mr. Maurer, a very open question. How would you see uh, how EU legislators should solve the issue of reaching recycling performance? by addressing um, some rules uh, for products, starting with the very beginning of the cycle. Uh, thanks, uh, but, but you're referring in particular to batteries. Yeah. That, that's the issue. Uh, well, as you know, uh, we currently um, are working, are still working on the, on the batteries uh, regulation uh, that you have probably intensively studied. Um, there's a lot of criticism, uh, but there's a lot uh, of new elements in there, uh, helping the recycling sector by increasing collection targets in particular, and um, um, for, for household batteries uh, mainly, and uh, by increasing uh, targets for the use of uh, recycled material in batteries. Uh, that is quite a big step forward. Uh, funnily, we have a situation today in the European Union where we have understood that waste law alone will not make the necessary change to help the Green Deal uh, to be a success if it might be a success one day, which is not at all certain for many reasons. Uh, it was understood that we need um, a side to waste policy measures, um, product policy measures. Uh, it's quite funny because the idea comes, I think, from myself. Uh, I never uh, stopped uh, harassing my director uh, with uh, ideas about we need a product policy, which was totally uh, considered as insane because we are so strong on waste policy. But finally, it was understood. I presented a, um, an instrument uh, that I outlined, which was very holistic um, and going beyond incremental changes. Uh, this was heavily discussed in the European uh, Commission and finally, as you know, uh, we had a situation or we now have a situation where we have made a proposal on a product design uh, regulation. And now we see, and the product design regulation we have proposed, as you, know, as you have seen it, um, it comes falls short of addressing more than incremental improvements, but it, it has quite some important improvements. But we now have a situation where we have um, a product uh, legislation, 
in the pipeline coming being further developed also through delegated acts in the future um, being or becoming very detailed and at the same time um, um, waste legislation like the batteries um, regulation um, which is covering the same object in, in, in this case batteries so we, we have batteries uh, under the under the eco design uh, regulation and we have batteries under the uh, batteries regulation and uh, it remains to be seen how this can be reconciled so we have uh, drivers from both sides as regards the the product design uh, regulation we will we will see a product passport we'll see a heavy digitalization um, uh, which is quite important because in future I cannot put anything on the market that does not respond to certain requirements of Article 5 of this of this product regulation. Uh, a lot of transparency uh, has to be provided. I have to see uh, be a, as a consumer, I have to be able to see what is in the product, what's happening with the product, where does it come from, etc., uh, to make also an informed choice. At the at the other side, uh, on the on the batteries uh, regulation, we have uh, uh, spe specific uh, uh, provisions um, on, uh, as I said already, and as as, as said uh, my my uh, previous speaker said, um, on on collection and and recycling content. Uh, what we are missing surprisingly is a regulation on or a, a provision on um, that enables us to ensure that the battery comes back we saw the picture of the of the incinerated hole uh, uh, which is quite a, a, a frequent phenomenon uh, one would be surprised and comes from the fact uh, that people do not adequately dispose of their batteries and in the process which is relatively uh, a, a simple and, and a rough process uh, then uh, lithium uh, ion batteries get uh, badly treated and they get fire for, um, and, 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 uh, and, and we have uh, in incidents of, of, uh, of uh, big fires uh, it, it's surprising that the legislation that we have proposed uh, is not sufficiently taking this into account. The most effective way to take this into account would be uh, to go for deposit return systems. So sell a battery, uh, which is a dangerous object or prone of uh, causing fire incidents and sell it with a deposit of, let's say 10% of the purchasing price. Then you can be sure that you get your stuff back in a safe way, in a controlled way and uh, can avoid such incidents. And this deposit return a principle is of course a general principle, which is not generally taken up in EU legislation, which is a pity, I think, uh, because it is highly effective. Um, you can imagine what the reasons may be, or too much bureaucracy, uh, too, too, too complicated to execute, etc. These are excuses. And I promise you, or I, <laughs> I predict rather than promise you, uh, that in the, in the years to come, we'll see a lot more um, a lot more of, of such systems which are highly affected. affected. So uh, let's see uh, what the legislation uh, brings once uh, the final acts are adopted, uh, which is not uh, perfectly pre predictable. Um, they will bring a lot of improvements, um, but the next steps have to be prepared already and the next steps will have to be much bolder steps than the ones we have now put on the table. We have to in particular, ensure that all batteries, portable batteries in particular as well, and there I do not agree with you, uh, portable batteries must absolutely not get into the, into the municipal waste to be treated with any other waste. They must get out of there. And I see no reason why when I as a customer go to shop and buy 10 AA cells for, for whatever stupid thing I, I want to, to put a battery into, uh, why I should not pay a deposit to be absolutely certain that this thing does not land in, in the waste bin where it has nothing. Because we're talking about chemistry and chemistry uh, on a landfill and chemistry in an incinerator causes problems. And uh, as regards chemistry, we are also overstepping planetary boundaries, Green Deal, you know. Um, we are currently, uh, we're heading in 2050 towards the use of 5 billion tons of chemicals, which is tripling the chemicals we are using today, can you imagine? So we, we have all reason to ensure that chemicals are uh, sufficiently controlled and kept out of normal waste streams, which are not necessarily hazardous waste streams. So absolutely, we need to ensure that this stuff comes out there. Sorry, I talked a bit 
too long. No, thank you very much. It was very interesting to know where we come from and where we'll, we will we'll finish. <laughs> the, the future is ours. I mean, lots of uh, new regulations, but there are lots of problems to tackle. Make sure the collection is quality and is increased, and then the treatment also from the industry side. So, um, um, if you haven't, if you have any other remark on what was said for one minute, Piotr, uh, Petr, sorry, or, or Holger, uh, and then the floor will be to the other panel. If you are, if you think everything was said about challenges or triggers, but then. Okay, uh, I would like uh, to react to Mr. Morer. So I'm not against a higher collection of portable batteries. But we have, especially in this field, we have so many tasks, we have so many uh, things to improve that for me as a practical guy who organized collection for 20 years, so I, can, I cannot see increase of collection target for consumer batteries as the high priority. I explained why, yeah. Let's focus on lithium-ion batteries, on dangerous types, on the batteries which contain uh, critical, critical elements like cobalt, nickel, lithium. That's for me higher priority. So, but that doesn't mean that I'm against a higher collection of consumer batteries. Holger, any final remark? Final, final. May I have to repeat this? So, okay. Uh, uh, I think he, uh, Peter is totally right. The problem will be we have a collection rate for batteries which are now put on the market mm -hmm. with a high quality, which in end of life of, of 12, 15 years. Uh, we learned this from the automotive side and in realistic, my company also work on a, a longer distance life uh, for the chem material. Um, to get a collection rate, and if you see the, the data of Germany, I think 50% of the input market uh, if I look um, on the customer bat batteries, on consumer batteries, Ali to Mayan batteries, was an end of life of 10 years. And to collect this, it was a collection rate of 65%. I think it's not possible because these batteries are not for the recycling. So we have a collection rate based on 50%, which are coming for end of life. And you, you see it at your home, your, your screwdriver, maybe 10 years, my, my e-bike, hopefully the the battery will be have an end of life of six, seven years. So um, the base of the collection rate for lithium ion batteries is not the same like, like alkaline batteries, which alkaline batteries are coming one year, three years later. Um, so the collection rate also for these household batteries will be very big target. And in this moment, I have to say it's good for us that we're only working with industrial batteries um, because this target will be very high to, um, for lithium ion batteries. And then if I see the new data also in Germany that 50% which from these uh, consumer batteries are lithium ion batteries, it will be easy for, uh, fine for me to see how we can increase the collection rate in the next 10 years. Thank you very much. May I add one sentence, one positive, word. positive sentence at the end. One uh, word. So uh, for last two years, we started project of second life of lithium-ion batteries. And uh, we found out uh, that it works, especially for the batteries, uh, lithium batteries to power tools for e-bikes. And last year we reached 60% of returnability of lithium-ion lithium cells for not for, let's say, the new e-bikes but for some storage storage batteries yeah so that's the way we have to we have to follow as well so thank you for this positive note as a conclusion of this first panel thank you very much three of you
And now I'm calling on stage uh, Mr. Koff, Mr. Schon and von Kennel, and Ms. Jimenez Coloma, sorry. For the panel on innovation, I introduce the speakers and our vice president, future president of FIAD, will moderate the discussion. So now it's my pleasure to introduce the panel, the panelists on innovation. Uh, we have uh, Pablo Koff, who joined Suez in 2013 as a research and innovation project manager in the field of bioenergy and biorefinery from, from wastewater and waste. Uh, we have Johannes Kuhn and Andreas von Kennel. Um, so, um, sorry, Johannes has been responsible for Remondis Digital Services as a managing director since two years. And Andreas von, von Kennel is the co founder of Cortexia. Um, he will explain. Uh, and we have uh, Elena Jimenez Coloma. Uh, she, uh, currently project and circular economy manager in the engineering department of Prezero, Spain and Portugal. So the floor in, is your for the first present for the presentations on your project and I will give the moderation desk to Claudia. Okay, well, um, good morning everyone. Thank you for being here. Thank you for the FEAT for the invitation. It was uh, really nice to receive it on behalf of Suez and the team I represent. I thank you very much for that. Um, I'm very excited to present about this because it, this is a topic that I really like uh, for a long time already. And uh, performing in Suez, working in Suez with the team I work with, um, allow me to de fully develop uh, many or say ideas that we are uh, considering that are fully in line as well with the strategies that we see from the uh, European Commission. So I'm going to focus specifically on organic waste today. The waste is very big, uh, it's very diverse. My presentation today will be focused on organic waste and it will be focused on one of the activities that we have within Suez. So uh, probably some of you already heard about Suez. We are a big company, we are present in many places, we do many stuff and we are a lot of people. Um, but we are all facing uh, times that change and this is this is this is important for this presentation because it's, it's, it's what I'm going to present is is a response of changing times so you are performing in the waste sector probably longer than I am and you understand this much better than I do so we live in a world that is overpopulated with uh, suffering from overconsumption oversourcing etc 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 and in which when we see decisions that are made are not always the best or not always the ones that present the most uh, higher level of sense so is this is is in this regard in this framework that in the company i represent today we make some questions saying okay how are we going to do this i mean how are we going to perform in the waste sector based on these uh, changing conditions the customer is facing new requirements, the end customer is facing new, uh, let's say, limitations, and we need to perform and provide a solution that makes sense to all of them at once. So my, my grandfather told me once when I was a young man, um, Pablo, the worst decision you can make is the decision that you don't understand. So I think that we can translate this into our sector today because a lot of decisions will need to be made in order to uh, achieve all the results that we need to do. It's a lot of work still to be done. So it's in that regard that Suez answers to this call of changing times by building this. This is our bioresource lab. It is located in Narbonne. Uh, it's, a, it's a place in the south of France. You can see we have a lovely view of the Mediterranean Sea, and a great weather to work there, so it's a pity to be in the lab all the time. 
but uh, going out for Abero afterwards is a pretty nice experience. Um, so going back to this, this is a five million answer that Swiss brings together in times of COVID, in times of, uh, let's say, uh, not the best uh, financial situation in Europe, but we believe it is the right move to be made in this right moment. So this is an advanced research and innovation platform that is intended to bring better and higher and deeper understanding on the issues that our customers face and the customers our customers face. Too. So basically, I will skip this. What we do is based on three main axes related to organic waste, as I said before, and the processes that are in the value chain afterwards, like methanization, for example, and the application and development of agricultural products based on the uh, amount of uh, materials that we manage every year. As you saw in the first slide, <clears throat> we manage a couple of millions of tons every year, so it's a very big responsibility on knowing better what to do with it and the environmental, consequ environmental consequences that uh, they convey. So besides the normal operations related to waste of these materials, like collection and characterization, uh, evaluation of environmental footprints, blah, blah, blah. We aim higher with this platform and we believe this platform will allow us, like a child is, is allowed by a student to go up to the drawers in the kitchen. It's exactly the same thing here. So we believe we can uh, start looking into a bioeconomy framework for organic waste. Let's remember that. Um, identifying and developing new routes for uh, channeling all these materials at a higher value all the time, like one of the driving principles of circular economy. So our projects are usually targeting small arcs of a bigger uh, circular um, value chain. So as an example, we participate uh, in a project called After Biochem. Um, After Biochem is basically uh, a project funded by the bio-based industries uh, joint undertaking uh, from the European Commission. Uh, it, this project is, we are 12 partners working with uh, organic uh, residues led by a French startup company called uh, um, Afiren. And this is basically the setup of the, of the, of the value chain. So Afiren has the objective of building three biorefineries for residual materials as a feedstock in France until 24. The first one is being finished as we speak and uh, is the target of the first project called After BioK. So Suez and Sutsuka, a German company, as you probably know, uh, we provide the organic residuals for the feedstock. And uh, this uh, company, Afiren, with patented processes and technologies within this biorefinery will transform them into um, almost 15,000 tons of acids and esters for the cosmetic industry in France. So as you can imagine, this is a step function in terms of valorization of organic materials uh, towards something that is totally in line with the objectives of the waste um, market in Europe, but also the environmental services market in Europe, which we want to join. Um, the name Suez, you probably hear it also related to the channel of Suez that connects not, not, not only, is, this is not only a civil work in which we participated at the very beginning of our company, but this is also something that connects two different worlds. And we believe that this type of projects, this type of technologies, this type of, of um, mindsets will connect two things as well. The world we live in with all the needs and challenges we are all facing here in terms of technology, in terms of social impact, environmental impact and financial impacts, we're talking business here with the world of the future, which is, a, let's say, a higher level bioeconomy driven by circular structures. So uh, if you ask me, and this is basically the topic of this uh, presentation of this uh, forum, is uh, what about technology and innovation? Of course, the two goes together, but in the near, the, we need a challenge, we need a problem to solve. There is no innovation without a solution. And the solution we, we believe it will be the best for customers and end users, needs to come out of this exercise. Usually collaborative exercise, as we can see in this, uh, in this project here. Uh, 
And for the, this future I'm mentioning, that I hope we will uh, arrive all together in, in good shape, by the way, um, it's, it's not really a technology, the key, or a specific type of innovation. It's a mindset. And on my way to this meeting room this morning, I was rushing through the whole different halls as I saw this one. And I believe that this one exemplarized very well uh, the mindset that we have. It's, it's this mindset of not considering waste as a waste, as a residue, as something secondary, that we really will make us thrive towards solutions that we don't have today. So again, on behalf of my team and Swiss, thank you very much for the invitation and this, uh, this time for presenting. Thank you very much. <laughs>
innovative digital solutions for the whole group. And today I would like to introduce you Datafleet. Um, Datafleet is a solution which is quite similar to the Cortexia solution because we also combine cameras with an AI embedded solution in a garbage truck, but not the view on the road surface, but furthermore on the um, road surrounding, so that our solution can AI-based and automatically detect environmental data such as traffic signs, potholes or illegal dumps, for example. And with our Datafleet software, we provide the data to cities, to municipalities, to make cities cleaner and safer. Um, it's an in-house development of the Romandus Group, but it's not only limited to the Rom Romandus fleet. And we are now successfully um, in more than 15 cities in Germany, and the goal is by the end of the year having around about 100 systems on the street. But what's the background? Why are we doing all of this? Um, cities have to ensure that everything in the streets or of the city is okay. For this, street walkers go through the cities every day to detect su such things like potholes or like um, illegal dumps, for example. And now you can see it here on the left side of the picture. They are doing it not always in a digital way. So data is not digital. Data is not available centrally, and the evaluation is often very subjectively. And furthermore, it's very difficult and very hard to find people who want to go to do the job, going every day 20 kilometers uh, in the city in the city by wind and weather. <clears throat> so, we support with our data fleet solution the daily business, the daily work of the street walkers. I will give you a practical example of the city of Overhausen, which is in the western part of Germany, around about 200,000 inhabitants. And um, the WBO Oberhausen is a private-public partnership between Remondes on the one hand, and on the other hand, the city of Oberhausen. And there, we use three data fleet systems to control the entire road network of around about 550 kilometers um, in a rotation of two weeks. So in two weeks, we control the whole road network and provide the traffic sign data to the WBO in Oberhausen because they are also responsible for the repair and for the maintenance of the traffic signs. So every day we check more than a thousand traffic signs with this technology and we categorize them into different types of mangle like overgrown, faded out, dirty traffic signs or um, outdated pictograms. Um, if you, so that you have a feeling, in the last months we um, provided round about the information of 80 overgrown traffic signs in the month of April. But what is happening now with the data? The data is used by the WBO in Oberhausen to plan optimized maintenance. They can use the data, as you can see it here on the right side. You know what kind of traffic sign it is, you know where it is located, you know um, what type of mangle it has, and we combine the picture of the last drive-through with the object. So the WBO in Oberhausen has the relevant information to plan optimized maintenance. And as you can see it here on the left side of the picture, um, you can pull a polygon around the um, uh, overgrown traffic signs here on the card, and you receive an offer list of the relevant traffic signs that have to be repaired or the leaves has to be cut. For us, these are really two good examples how AI and garbage trucks can, good, can work good together and to make cities cleaner and safer. Um, we are doing this together here in Germany on the German market. So if you have problems with uh, um, cleanliness in cities or with infrastructure management, Please feel free to contact us, um, define your targets, and we will reach them together. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mrs. Jimenez, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you very much to Fiat for inviting Prisero to participate in this conference. Uh, I'm going to, to present you a project we are, we are uh, promoting uh, jointly with Endesa and LM. 
in Spain in order to uh, provide a solution for wind-based blades recycling. Why we are uh, going ahead with this project? In Spain, we have a huge amount of wind turbines parts. In, uh, we have more than 20,000 uh, units of wind turbines installed in Spain with 28 gigawatts. That means a lot of equipment running every day, producing renewable energy. And uh, the problem with these parts is that they are really old. Considering that the wind turbine has around 25, 30 years old life span, uh, and that we have installed the first wind turbine parts in 1989, from now to 2030, we are going to, pro to have more than 12,000 uh, wind turbines that will arrive to, an, to the end of life. That means that we need to face this, let's say, challenge of providing a solution for the, the let's say, waste that could be produced by these, these turbines. On the other hand, uh, we have a renewable energy plan that uh, faces a challenging objective of uh, promoting to arrive to the 42% of energy, renewable energy uh, in the energy we are consuming in Spain. That means that we need to increase uh, the power, the installed power of the wind energy from 28 to 50 gigawatts. How can we do that? We can do that by uh, repowering the old wind, wind, wind bars, wind turbine bars, replacing old wind turbines, but new ones, new state of the art wind turbines. And that means that we are going, of course, to produce this waste. We need to provide a circular solution. Of course, there are some solutions for wind blades, but mainly these wind blades are uh, devoted to landfilling. So, uh, as Pablo said, uh, the client that was in the in this case said, us, please provide us a solution and we are uh, mm, developing a solution for those wind blades in order to go ahead with further uh, development. What happens with the waste when we dismantle the wind turbine? Mainly all the materials can be recycled because we have iron, steel, uh, plastics. For those materials, we have a solution, but the 5% of the waste we are producing when we dismantle the wind turbine are not recyclable, or there are few alternatives for recycling. That is the wind blades. These wind blades are made of composites, fiberglass, fiberglass composites or carbon glass composites, a carbon fiber composites. And it is, it is a material that has been uh, created to not be destroyed. To, to, to survive. That means that we need to face this material that is really, uh, really difficult to recycle. Our forecast, uh, considering this repowering of the wind blades, I, or wind turbine parts, is that uh, in Spain it's going to be produced from now to 2030 around an average of 10,000, 15,000 tons per year of composites from the wind energy sector. So it's a, it's a challenge project. And our purpose is, uh, and this uh, Presiro and LM purpose, is to provide a circular solution for these composites to scale it up all those developments that have yet been developed in la at large scale or pilot scale, but that, not, that needs, needs to be uh, deployed at industrial scale with the, the, with the risk that it is involved, and to convert these end-of-life wind blades in secondary raw materials, able to be used in the, in the market. How we are going to do that? We are going to do that. Our, our approach is with a multipurpose uh, plan. The multipurpose in terms of input material and output material. In terms of input material, we are going to process composites from the wind energy industry, but also from the shipping industry, from the pipes industry, every kind of composites that can be produced uh, as a waste in the, in the industry. And on the other hand, we are going to manage and to treat scraps, textile scraps that is produced by manufacturing wind blades. They, they, they use like a fiberglass scraps and then the cuttings of these scrap, of these textiles are scraps that, that currently they are sending to the landfill. So with this plan, we are facing those both, uh, do, the, those waste streams. We are uh, developing a, um, a process uh, focusing mechanical treatment. In, in, for composites, we are going to, uh, 
to shred the composites and to adapt the particle size of the composites and the composition in order to be the both to different markets. The baseline will be a solid recovery fuel that is yet implemented in the market, but we want to go ahead and we are uh, developing projects in order to use these composites for producing uh, final products like mm, uh, plastic good, profiles for construction, aggregates for concrete, in order to uh, avoid the loss of, uh, of, uh, of materials that implies to use solid recovery fuel, the composite, composite as solid recovery fuel. And on the other hand, for the scraps uh, that is going to be treated in a separate line, uh, we are going to do to, to produce uh, re recycled fiber that we had yet validated that can be used for insulation panels in the automotive sector. So with these both lines, we are trying to uh, get the most material as possible from the composites and from the wind industry, uh, wind energy industry. The plan will have a capacity of, uh, of treating 6,000 tons of composites and around 1,500 1, tons on, of scraps. Uh, the investment uh, is around 8 million euros and the employments we are going to create is are around 30 jobs. Where the plant will be located? In the northwest of, west of Spain. Why? Because here we have two main reasons to implement this plant. The first one is that Endesa has there a, an old coal power plant that they have dismantled and Endesa has a real and uh, commitment on uh, deploying new activities and promoting new activities on those areas where the coal power plants have been dismantled in order to maintain the employment in this area. And the second reason is, as you can see in the map, in the northwest of Spain, we have the most concentration of wind turbines. So uh, if we place the plant there, we are going to have more, uh, more ac access to the, to the waste produced by the dismantling of the wind turbines. Our objective is to have this plan operative in 2024. And I have already mentioned it, but we are three partners that cover all the value chain of the, of the process we are proposing. We have Endesa, that is the first company providing electricity in Spain, and they have a real commitment with a provision of renewable energies. Uh, we are to Endesa, I, uh, Precero is a, is a German, co German company of Group Schwartz. Uh, we provide circular economy solutions and we provide advanced state-of-the-art processes to, to recover and to, and to manage uh, waste, uh, waste. And in, in Spain, we have more than 100, 140 facilities managing waste. And the third partner is LM, that is one uh, is part of GE, uh, General Electric. General Electric, as you know, is one of the most important actors in renewable energy in the world. And LM has in, in Spain two plants for producing wind blades. Uh, and for this reason, they are really important in order to close the loop and to have access to, to different waste flows. So thank you for your attention. And this was all I wanted to, to explain. Thank you. So thank you very much for your presentations. Uh, certainly, you showed show to us uh, how important is research and development in your day-by-day um, uh, -day job. And um, listening to you, certainly uh, we can uh, uh, comprehend how much you are investing in, uh, your, in, your, in your job uh, every day um, to be always in line with the uh, change that we are facing, that we see uh, in our day-by-day -day life uh, and also in our sector. And now our sector uh, needs to be always uh, ahead sometimes of this, uh, um, these um, new things that we're using day by day, like we were just listening before to the situation for the batteries for the e-bikes. Uh, Ten years ago, the e-bikes weren't uh, present, so we, were, we weren't aware of that problem. Now it's a problem, so we have to solve it, and we have to be very quick 
And this is the same uh, uh, situation. We are very quick, uh, and you explained for the digitalization. Uh, you were explaining, uh, uh, and I was very much interested, that, and I will say, uh, I say also very envious of your colleagues that are working in Arbonne, because the place is beautiful. And, uh, and also very interested in your presentation about the wind blade, because of course we are seeing uh, a lot of this uh, now, uh, also in Italy, it's becoming now uh, more, more common, but of course in, uh, in Europe much more. Um, and so it, it's important to see uh, what we are going to do with that when it's going to be uh, disposed of. Uh, but I would like also to, uh, I would like to ask you uh, just one question. I will ask this question to each of you, so feel free to answer. To which extent do innovation and digitalization contribute to a performance waste management uh, and the achievement of the European Green Deal? What are the, you know, the, the, the task, uh, the limitation and the challenges that you are facing? Please. Yes, of course. Thank you. I will come back to Pablo's grandfather. He said uh, we have to take the right decisions today. So I think digitalization helps to bring the information to, the, to, to, to have the, the right and reliable information to take the good decisions. And uh, I would uh, like to take the example of bio waste. So for me, bio waste is a really the, a, a super example of what should be recycling because we we recycled it in uh, biogas and uh, compost for the for the farmers but there is a problem in this uh, recycling um, uh, circle because at the beginning uh, some people don't uh, um, <clears throat> so some people put some plastics and it's very difficult to have these plastics away in the whole uh, flow and at the end today i think it's 1.5 million micro uh, tons of microplastics which each year we put on the on the fields so having the measurement of plastic content at the collection at the entrance of the bio waste plant at the exit helps to control where the problem really is and then we can really go on the where we have the most impact make the changes and measure the results i think this is one example and we use it also for uh, the clean cities. This is the way we should work with data and digitalization can help for this. I will add a question just for you. Uh, do you think that this way to work, this new way of work, is also creating a new appeal of our sector? So people are much more interested in coming and work for our companies? Uh, today I can say definitively yes. At the beginning we were putting cameras on sweepers and we were afraid that people say, oh, they will control us. What we see now is we control the quality of their work and we have figures to show what they are doing because people are uh, throwing litter in the streets and they can show how, how much work they do and what is the resulting quality. So. Of course, technology does not, uh, is not the solution for everything. We have to involve people, but if we make it wisely, um, it's also what we have as input from the cities that it gives new technological or new interest to the job. It's not only the old way of doing, but it has more like rewardness for the people who are involved in these uh, jobs. Yeah. Thank you very much for your answer. And uh, can I ask also to you one question? Uh, in your lab, this bio-research bio lab, this uh, very, very interesting place, uh, did you have uh, problems in finding people with the right skills to work <laughs> and to also develop new ways or also thinking of this waste and what I can do with this waste? Yeah, actually, it's, it's, uh, I don't know you, but uh, we are facing a lot of uh, trouble uh, getting the right people. Because, of course, uh, if you look for to do uh, the same things that we have been doing for the last 20 years, you already have the people for that. But now we are facing a challenge that requires something different. So you need to think different. You need to approach the waste different. You need to integrate technologies that are not from the waste sector into the waste sector. Communication the digital part, blockchain, um, fin financing that needs to go down to how you trace the ton of 
material you are transporting, etc. So all of these things have an impact in what you decide to do. And so a person that works in this lab is not just a person that is good in chemistry or microbiology or material resistance. It needs to have a broader spectrum of skills. And that is hard to find. So to answer your question, yes, yes. it is, <laughs> it is. And a question for Mrs. Simenez. Uh, I think that now people and, and the young people especially are changing the, their way to think about uh, what, what, I will, what I would like to do in the future. And uh, it's becoming more common to talk with people and with young people that are saying, I want to work in an environmental place. I want to work for the environment. I want to be uh, useful. I want to be someone that is doing something for, for the society. And uh, I think uh, in your uh, situation with your project that is very interesting, uh, probably you uh, were able to to uh, at attract a lot of young people in working on that. Uh, it's, uh, it's very much technology based. Yeah, I, I would say that in innovation is one of the most uh, interesting, interesting sectors and in, in waste management and in all other areas for people that is just finishing its studies. So I think, yeah, uh, of course, uh, to, to look for people to, other, to tackle this kind of projects is, is let's say, uh, really easy because it's really attractive, okay? But the problem now is that uh, we are facing is that um, it's difficult to, to, to find uh, the profiles with this, uh, let's say, um, see open thinking because uh, the, the, the education is, is like say they really addressed to an specialization so uh, when when you told them for example about an open project that do you need to touch different sectors it's like something that is oof, they stop them because they need to to, to think much more uh, out of the of the of their, uh, their their knowledge okay i don't know if i, I have asked your question but yeah, it's attractive, but then when you explain them the project, it's like, uh, oof, I don't have the knowledge to, 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 to tackle it. But on the other hand, um, concerning the, the question to Pablo, I would say that uh, one, one, one way to, to solve uh, that you cannot find those people with a profile in order to, to cover all the value chain is to collaborate. Circular economy has a lot to do with collaboration. Uh, when, when you don't have the profile, you need to look the profile outside and to collaborate with people that have this, this profile and this knowledge. And this is the way to, to, to really go ahead with circular solutions. If, you, if not, you inside with your knowledge, with your specialization in waste management, you are not able to do that. Thank you very much for your answers. They were very, very... Uh, straight at the point uh, i will say <laughs> so um i will just add one thing one little thing uh, when i was now it's about 25 years that i'm working in waste management sector so uh, at, at the beginning i was just graduated in chemistry and when when uh, i found this kind of job uh, other other my colleagues from university they were saying to me oh no it's not interesting you're not going to work for a pharmaceutical company or something much more you know appealing and that's why now i were i was asking you this question because we have seen this huge change in the last uh, decades, I would say, and we are much more now on a, a technology-based industry, uh, not just useful to, to get rid of, uh, of the waste, but we are able to uh, promote new ways of uh, recovery and to manage waste. And so that's very interesting. I think this is something that we have to promote much more, also, also as a communication, probably. Thank you very much again. Thank you very much. So thank you very much for all those very interesting projects and for you, Claudia, to have moderated this exchange. And now it's time to have the third panel um, and I'm calling on stage the panelists of the CO2 reduction 
study where we are going to present you a study that was commissioned by FEAD, by DWMA, the Dutch Waste Management Association, by CWEP, the Confederation of Waste to Energy Industry, uh, and RDF Group, uh, and Bärbel Bernstengel uh, from Prognos, who did this uh, very interesting study, if I may say, uh, will present it. Uh, please go on, on the stage. Uh, also, I invite on stage Chaim Weibel, who is um, uh, working uh, in, in Brussels uh, in um, Plastics Recyclers Europe. He's uh, one of our contact colleagues in Brussels. Uh, I also call on stage Ella Stengler, He's the managing director of CEWEP. He, she was also participating in the process of the study. And I also call on stage uh, Hunico van Koten from DWMA, our Dutch member, who's also uh, um, a, a partner in, in, in this study. So, sorry, Bärbel, the floor is... Yeah, but you can think. This is, yeah, it must be this one. If, if you can sit here, you, you see it on the screen. It's, it's, it's easier yeah. for you. Okay, hello to everybody. Uh, I would like to present only some figures, throw only some figures of our study into the room because I think the figures speak by themselves. So as Valerie already mentioned, we have carried out the study on behalf of Fiat, CEWEP, uh, the Dutch Waste Management Association and the RDF Industry Group. And we have focused on 10 waste streams with a high resource potential like metals, paper, glass, bio-waste, uh, waste tires, uh, metals. And we were considering, of course, a, a, a collected amount, the separate collected amount in statistics, but also the remaining potential in mixed waste streams, like in in construction, demolition waste, or in end-of-life uh, vehicles, etc. Uh, all these 10 uh, waste streams amount to more than 500 uh, million tons of the waste generated in EU. It's uh, related to uh, approximately 90%. But we have only uh, uh, not only focused on these 10 waste streams, but take into consideration also the remaining residual municipal waste and the sorting residues, because of course recycling without sorting residues is not possible, of course. Uh, we have focused on all EU member states plus UK, and we have running two projections until 2035, compared them to the baseline, our base year was 2018, and we have been running several sensibilities with regard to uh, the, the subject. As a result, we started in 2018 with a small burden, but it's still a burden of 13 million tons of CO2 equivalents generated by the waste management sectors with these waste streams, which we had considered. But when we were looking on our projection one, means the implementation of the existing legislation for municipal waste, and implementing this legislation also to commercial and industrial waste, so going beyond the existing legislation. So we came up to a reduction potential of 150 million tons of CO2 equivalents compared to uh, 2018. And then we increased our recycling efforts and we increased also uh, the, the efforts on the, uh, um, on the side for, for the residual municipal waste and for the sorting residues means decreasing landfilling to much as possible. And then we came up to a reduction potential of 296 million tons compared to the base year in 2018. So diverting from landfill as much as possible and of course recycling as much as possible. Uh, Peter Kurt already mentioned it, so waste management is uh, uh, cross industrial inter has a lot of in cross industrial interlinkages. We are giving a lot to the industry on secondary raw materials, but of course, to be able to, to achieve all this potential, which we had shown here, we need also the support of the industry, beginning from the design of the product design, from the production, because only waste management industry at the end cannot 
achieve all these potentials. So we need the co uh, co uh, cooperation. Of course, uh, we need, uh, and, and this was mentioned by, by Peter Kratochwil here, we need not fo only focus on municipal waste, but also on the industrial waste. And of course, we need the support of the legislation on the European Commission on this way. So that's very brief, but the main key figures of our study. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bebel. This is the CO2 study in a nutshell. You know as much as you need to know. And I also have the pleasure to welcome again on the panel, Mr. Maurer, who is still from DG Environment and still interested in our uh, waste management improvement. So um, a, first, a first question, maybe to, to Unico, <laughs> because DWMA was a partner of this study. What would, and, and you know everything about it, so what would be your general remark on, on, the, on, on, on our contribution to those results, which, by the way, is um, with CO2 reduction potential, including the reductions of CO2 emitted by the industry or by the energy sector when using recyclate or when, you, when using heat or electricity from waste. It's not only us, it's the whole economy. So what would be your remark as one of the participants uh, in this consortium for the study? Yes, um, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I also would like to honor the founding fathers, uh, Mr. Edelhoff and Mr. Reitman, and also uh, Mr. Burry and the past presidents, because your work shaped also where we are now. Uh, and it the journey started in Europe in uh, 82. And we are now uh, 40 years uh, further in time. And I was just reading also the book of uh, Fayad, which is very interesting, which gives also a timeline of what has happened. <laughs> uh, you know better than me, but uh, a lot of things ha have happened uh, at the European level, but also in your companies. And uh, that's also what my job makes it so nice that I get from my members uh, the message that some things are possible and that we need also European legislation for that. And then I, I do my best to with the, with the member experts to, to make that happen. And that happened also in 2008, uh, when we uh, commissioned the first prognosis study with already CO2 potential presented to the European Commission. And what we wanted was very clear. We wanted to have a 50% recycling target. We wanted to have the R1 status for, for the waste to energy which then in effect also uh, produced a, no a significant energy efficiency in the Netherlands and in Germany, for instance. Uh, and we wanted to have more attention on the bio-waste recycling, which also uh, yeah, gained a lot of traction and a lot of companies could invest in, in, in Europe. And I think this is for the past presidents and also for the founding fathers of it, I think also a very positive present uh, to see that still there is potential in the waste uh, and based on the fact that we have the technology also most, more, most, more, most likely in place to fulfill scenario one, the 150 uh, CO2 savings uh, as soon as possible. Um, so let me then come uh, to, the, to the conclusion, what do we need then at the European level? to at least uh, as soon as possible uh, reach uh, and, and reap the benefits of the 150 million tons CO2 savings. Yeah, and that would be uh, an, 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 uh, a complete uh, landfill uh, reduction target uh, for recyclable and recoverable waste. Uh, or companies, the companies I represent, uh, want that this business model of large scale landfilling of recyclable, recoverable waste is ending in Europe as soon as possible. We want to use and utilize all the recyclables which are there in the waste and also for the, for the residuals uh, which are there to utilize the energy content in that material. And that means then also, uh, uh, Mr. Mauer, that um, uh, it's also a celebration for, for us, the Dutch Waste Management Association, because we decided, uh, our government decided in 1994 to end to end the, the, the business model of large-scale landfilling of recyclable and recoverable waste. And we have people here in the room who, who were there in the 90s uh, from the company side, who also told the government in the 90s already that it was possible, that the technology was there to valorize as much as waste as possible. 
And they, together with the government uh, and with the municipalities, have made it happen. Uh, um, uh, very soon thereafter, I think that uh, in, in the five years after 94, uh, we already reached a very s solid uh, reduction of the of the, uh, of the large scale land filling. And you saw, saw in five years time already an enormous uptick of composting and recycling and sorting plants. So it is possible. The companies have the, 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 the know-how and also the means in place. The only thing we need at the European level is uh, for all the wastes, an, 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 uh, uh, if it can be recycled and recovered, an, an European landfill ban as soon as possible. I would like to ask Heim Weibel for the plastic recycling sector. Uh, what you would expect, given those potentials, uh, from the EU legislature to reap this potential and to improve the plastics very low recycling rate? Yes, first of all, thank you for having me here today. Um, I think the discussion that we have uh, here in, in, in with the previous speakers, also in the previous panels, gave a really clear um, picture of where we have where we are today and the study that has been conducted uh, and presented uh, uh, really provide um, a numerical figure of uh, the opportunities, the challenges and, and opportunities. Um, for what it concerns plastics, I would perhaps recall the, the, um, the figure that you gave before on uh, the transition from the waste legislation perspective to a product legislation perspective. And I think that that's going to be probably the key in the upcoming years uh, in terms of uh, uh, focusing more upstream uh, in, the, in the value chain of plastic and uh, of plastic management by uh, pushing and increasing design for recycling not only on packaging but uh, widening the scope uh, to other industry sectors so also uh, let's say putting in practice uh, the, the commitment by the Gr European Green Deal and the new circular economy action plan so for that, for sure, in order to uh, increase uh, um, the amount of uh, materials that can be and will be recycled, uh, design will represent uh, a, a, a key point there, for sure. Um, yes. So. Yes, you you mentioned when preparing this event also some some challenges. Uh, link to the imports or link to homogeneity or how would you yes so for sure um, when we talk about recycling and recycling of plastic what is very relevant is to have not only in terms of quantity an important amount of feedstock that can uh, um, that will go towards our recycling facility but it's also in terms of quality so it's a homogenization of the stream so you need to have pretty much the, a very similar uh, waste input specification entering a recycling facility and uh, on a sufficient quantity and this is the same for whatever uh, recycling uh, technology you might have in mind so for in order to 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 insist on that for sure, there must be uh, some enforcement measures uh, um, looking on uh, how um, Europe not only exports its waste uh, and its recyclates, uh, but also on, on the way um, these materials are imported in the EU, because we can uh, advance on design for recycling, for example, in the EU, but then uh, other countries outside the EU might not be at the same level. And this is where the CBAM, this is where, well, from the EU perspective, this is where the EU taxonomy regulation will uh, help the sector quite a lot. But from the outside world, this is where the CBAN can and other, so the carbon border and adjustment mechanism and other uh, e upcoming EU instruments might, might come at help. And in terms of harmonization uh, of, uh, of the waste, homogenization, sorry, of the waste stream, harmonization of uh, how products are placed on the market is also uh, another key aspect to be covered in terms of standardization, in terms of, uh, again, design for recycling guidelines and methodologies, not only for packaging, but for uh, a wider um, set of end application for plastics and also for recycled plastics. And again, uh, if I look uh, at uh, the upcoming policies, at the upcoming legislation at the European level, the message is very much positive 
if we look uh, not only at the batteries regulation, but I have more in mind on the ELV directive uh, and uh, the way it will be shaped uh, on a directive that is not only focused on the waste management of vehicles, but also on, on how vehicles are and com vehicles components are designed. And again, a very positive message from, uh, from the Commission and from the EU as well. Thank you, Chaim. This goes hand in hand with mandatory cycle contents and such market signals. Thank you. Ella, have you a comment to this study you know as well as we know? And, and maybe comments not only on substitution of fossil fuel by waste and energy independence, etc., but also the vision for the future, how to make it happen? Yes, uh, thanks Valerie. And first of all, happy birthday, Fayad, and good luck for the next 40 years. Um, <laughs> yeah, you, uh, actually, CWEB was very happy to join forces again with Fayad and, and the Dutch Waste Management Association, the RDF group. Uh, we did already the 2008 study, and I must say the forecast from Prognos was quite good at that time, so we were quite optimistic to do it again. And now the calculations, well, they show the potential. That's, of course, there are a lot of insecurity about it. But when it showed one thing, it is how important implementation is. Because we have, well, since a while already in place, some waste legislation regarding recycling, landfill diversion. But reality is unfortunately still far away from that in some member states. So implementation is really, really key, key and we should uh, really all um, try to to get to it and then of course uh, ambitious uh, further uh, legislation and uh, I don't want to repeat it Babel Bernstein very nicely presented it what would be possible if we would be more ambitious on uh, inter alia waste targets so when it comes to waste to energy uh, of course uh, and we talk about climate here uh, of course, waste to energy uh, does emit uh, fossil CO2 emissions. It comes from the non-recyclable plastic waste, which is not great. But it happens that, uh, and as long as we cannot recycle 100% of plastic waste, um, then waste to energy plant operators take it as a service to society, and uh, yeah, and this causes the fossil fuels emitted by waste to energy plants. And um, that's about 400 kilograms per ton treated. And um, yeah, what to do? Of course, the sector is thinking how to contribute to, to, to climate mitigation. So first of all, um, it um, compensates the fossil CO2 emissions already now via recovery of, um, uh, of the bottom ash. Metal recycling, for instance, uh, helps to save CO2 emissions. Uh, but also substitution of fossil fuels, so providing heat and electricity uh, that can substitute um, uh, fossil fuels. And also, more important than ever during these times, helps to make Europe a bit less dependent on fossil fuel imports, so it helps to security of energy supply. Actually, currently, the amount of energy that is produced by the European waste to energy plants corresponds to about 9% of the gas imports from Russia that we still have. And if we would realize the um, potentials that uh, Prognos has um, uh, showed us, then uh, this could be tremendously higher, this, this figure. And I think it's worth uh, every trial. Uh, additionally, in the future, I don't know if I should if you have, I have time. something to say on the future, we are keen on okay. hearing it. <laughs> so, of course, additionally, the sector is looking um, how to do more to climate mitigation. And for waste to energy, one option that the sector is currently investigating is CO2 capture. And then either use it once there is a market or store it. So it's not a walk in the park. <laughs> it's uh, quite expensive. And uh, some promising projects have started across Europe, in, in Oslo, in, in the Netherlands, in Germany, in, in, in many countries. Others are looking into it. Um, yeah, so it is relatively easy to capture from the chimney the CO2. It is easier than for other disturbing, uh, for, for other CO2 emissions. Uh, but still, you need the space for the carbon capture, so there are some practical um, criteria you have to fulfill, and you need an economy of size. 
So if you have a very small waste to energy plant, then it might be not feasible to do it. So there are several factors uh, which have to be considered to make carbon capture and use or storage feasible. Also, the local conditions are decisive. You need an infrastructure to transport the CO2. You need a market, what to do with the CO2. You could produce methanol, for instance, for the chemical industry, but the market uh, must be there. Or you store it, uh, as in, in Oslo, they are the, the, the prototype now for, for promoting carbon capture and storage. Uh, yeah, this is all investigated now. And um, of course, in order to do that, investment is necessary and also investment security. And in order to do that, some enabling conditions uh, would be necessary. Uh, that would be a call to policymakers to um, to make some uh, some paving elements um, to, to, to make this happen. This is, uh, first of all, um, the after implementation of EU waste legislation and being more ambitious in diverting waste that can be recycled and used for energy recovery uh, from landfills. This is uh, strengthening the waste hierarchy, minimizing the methane from landfills, applying life cycle uh, assessment, and recognizing the role of waste to energy in a, a sustainable waste management uh, system, including taxonomy. So we really need that the taxonomy finally discusses and considers the role that waste to energy plays in order to ch achieve a circular economy by treating the waste that is not yet recyclable. Um, and I've recently, so far, the European Commission was not uh, very eager to recognize waste to energy for its contribution to a circular economy and to also pollution prevention and control. Uh, I have a little bit hope since Rome decided, or the new major, uh, mayor of, of Rome decided to build a waste to energy plant there after decades of a real mess and real big problems in Rome, what to do with their waste. And um, then there was a, a, radio, a radio interview in Italy uh, and Franz Timmermans, the, the European Commission's first vice president, said, on answer to a question from the Italian uh, journalist, mm, if waste to energy is not hampered by European legislation, maybe he had taxonomy in, in, in mind. And uh, Franz Timmermans said, uh, no, if it's done in a sustainable way, uh, uh, then it's fine. I was happy to hear that. It, was, um, it gives me some hope that uh, the Commission will uh, recognize the role waste to energy can play if you have a situation like you have it in Rome, where it's even not uh, replacing landfilling, it's replacing, um, yeah, there are many Italians here, they can better explain what is the situation here. It's a definitely not sustainable situation that you have here. So, and in these cases, if waste to energy helps to solve uh, the waste problem, then I think it should be admitted uh, that it can contribute to sustainable circular economy. Thank you, Ella. There are some other points, but I, I fear I'm already... <laughs> <laughs> there are many other points. <laughs> But maybe this is a good transition for Mr. Mauro because I would, I would like to hear his, his comments on the not only the study but the role waste management plays in circular economy for avoiding CO2 emissions, not only waste to energy but also waste to energy, of course. Uh, so, what, what are your, your comments to this uh, stimulating work on the potential of CO2 savings yeah. with our activities? Uh, thanks, thanks a lot for that uh, complex question um traditionally of course we have uh, we have only had at our hand uh, the waste legislation and uh, since it came with 19 in, in 1975 with the waste framework directive a key instrument fantastic uh, legislation done by one or two persons by the way not working groups uh, we had a, a, a very powerful a piece of legislation and from this we have developed the waste stream directives and so on and, and the purpose was always you remember uh, in the result of the waste framework, that you talk about the uh, recycling society. The idea was uh, we have to strive for a situation where we make things and when they become, become waste, we have to recycle them. And recycling is already uh, was indicating a kind of what we later formulated into a circular economy, um, but uh, having more aspects than this. So, mm, 
unfortunately, at the time when this legislation was created, uh, the topic of climate change was not on the agenda. There was not uh, clarity about uh, how much CO2 emissions were linked to the production of stuff and to the uh, end of life treatment of stuff. Uh, this has only come relatively late, although one could have known if one wanted, uh, want, wanted to have known. Um, so in the, in the, in the younger, uh, I would say a couple of years ago, this discussion started, um, discussions uh, then came up the idea of we have to have something uh, next to the waste legislation that helps us mitigate CO2 emissions which is product policy in actual fact. So we need to design products in such a way that they last longer, that they are uh, refurbishable and last longer, uh, that they are made from sustainable materials that are not toxic, um, because that is in, in not in line with recycling if you want, and that they are finally recyclable if they become waste. Um, and sometimes in discussions with, with the waste world, I call it like this for the moment, uh, I get the impression we talk about so many technical things and people get entirely out of sight, although each individually knows very well that the objective, our most important objective, is not dealing with waste, is preventing waste. And we have to concentrate on this. So I want to give you one example. I mean, I could talk for hours about this, but I don't have the time. I want to give you only one example. Um, and it has to do with climate change and with CO2 emissions uh, to, to, to put the, the discussion on a higher level. IPEN, um, an association uh, comprising 600 NGOs, um, doing very nice scientific work, came out in end of 2021 with a study uh, showing uh, or determining how much CO2 emissions were linked to plastic production and recycling and, and accumulatively between 2020 and 2050. You know that until 2050, if we want to keep within 1.5 degrees centigrade or not go far beyond, uh, we have to we have a budget of 400 gigatons of CO2 that we can still emit. That's like a pocket with 400 gigatons. So they figured out that by 2050, we'll have a totally different situation. We'll have only 5% landfilling of plastic. That's their prediction based on Gaia and others, American scientists. Uh, we'll have 45 or 50% of uh, incineration and the rest will be recycling. Enormous uh, achievements in recycling. But the surprise, surprise, the bad surprise is that the accumulated CO2 will be 59 gigatons. Only for one single little waste stream, plastic, and that shows that there's something wrong. Huh? We can be perfect. We obviously, we, we predict that we do fantastic things in, in waste management, away from landfill, more recycling and so on. But still, we are far from being anywhere close to where we need to go. So there's something entirely wrong here. Huh? And, and that is something we have to, we have to um, um, uh, concentrate a lot more than, uh, than we did now. When I come back to, uh, to um, a product uh, legislation, uh, our, our objective must be to think about uh, how to redesign a whole economy from a, 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 a consumption economy, which wants to produce more and more and grow, right in the spirit of the Green Deal, by the way. You know, the Green Deal is a growth uh, strategy, as it says itself. Uh, we have to sw switch away from that to a use economy, which makes better use of raw materials. And if we achieve that, and only if we achieve that, we have a chance to significantly reduce uh, CO2 emissions. Now, waste uh, 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 economy and waste um, management will never be obsolete. It will always be highly important. And, and there is a, a, a potential to reduce CO2. And, uh, and, and, and this has many facets, but we have to be clear that waste management will not save us from CO2 emissions. Uh, it, it can only be an additional, uh, um, an additional um, uh, way of, of uh, achieving our reduction potential. But the, the most important impulse must come from shifting away and entirely restructure our economy. The time for incremental changes, and that has always been our policy, changing little things, becoming better every time. And you know that we become better every time, but we are, we are lost. We are not fulfilling what we have to deliver, unfortunately, despite of becoming better. Not incremental, but systemic change is needed. Unfortunately, the European Commission hasn't understood or accepted this yet. The, this wouldn't be traumatic. 
if we had another five years to experiment and to see, hmm, then we'll see what it has brought. And if it's not sufficient, we again uh, have higher targets or this and that. But these five years we have not got, that is the drama in the game. Why do we not have got them? Because uh, scientists, climate uh, scientists tell us very clearly by the middle of this decade, we'll probably forever have left the limit uh, of 1.5 degrees centigrade uh, average uh, temperature increase. And this is clearly to be shown because we are now at 417 ppm CO2 emissions, a uh, CO2 concentration in the atmosphere, and we are heading faster even towards 450. We are heading faster towards uh, tipping points. So, but but yeah. you know, the, uh, maybe think, just to act a little bit on that because we, the gloom and doom. I mean, I, I I cannot present this to my children. You know, uh, the point is that there will always be momentum to change, and uh, the there must also be a momentum for corporations in their strategic strategic outline, in their business modeling, to 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 make the change also happen. So the, the rhetoric, which often comes from Europe, that we, we have to have like, we have to crash the economy and go for the systemic uh, change. It takes the energy, it takes a little bit the energy away because you want actually that the steps you are doing are sustainable and well thought through. Uh, and, um, uh, and there can be things done, of course, uh, uh, rapidly, because I just mentioned that we already have since the 94, 94, a landfill ban on recyclable and recoverable waste. If you do that, you will save a lot of CO2. But a systemic uh, economic change, the way, the way you just presented it, sounds like to me like we are going to crash the whole current uh, economy and build it uh, in, a, in a way back, yeah, yeah. Uh, which I cannot uh, foresee in the future because you have to have also entrepreneurs and companies and, uh, and, and you have also other, other uh, things which are important for society, so, uh, social well-being. Uh, so there are also other dimensions of life which are also equally important as, uh, as trying to uh, reduce uh, the burden through uh, the climate impact. So I don't see this in, uh, one dimensional. You have to see it in, from a more multifaceted perspective, I think. I think not this, so this is a, a fascinating and complex discussion. We can continue here with some refreshments. Otherwise, we are completely out of time. We're just on time. So I want to say a big, big thank you to all panelists and speakers who are here. A big thank you again to all our past presidents, without whom we wouldn't be here this morning. Um, I ask um, Claudia to come to me for some closing remarks uh, and I want to invite all of you is our Czech member here we, we have a conference in Prague in Czech Republic on 22nd of September you may say some few words on this so thank you very much uh, apparently I'm the one that is going to close this event because Peter had to leave so uh, First of all, I would like to say to everyone, sorry for my bad English, but it was Peter that was telling me, you know, bad English is an international level, so you can be always understandable. <laughs> so that's it. Um, I will repeat myself in saying, uh, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to uh, all, all of you that came here, all the panelists, all this, uh, for this occasion to, to be together here to celebrate our 40, 40s with the brochure, with the 40s uh, birthday anniversary. I, I don't know what, what's better to call birthday, I would say. And um, uh, for now, I want to also to, uh, to, to say a special thanks to our past president. It was a pleasure for me to meet you, uh, an honor, I will say. So a big thank also to you. And finally, uh, thank to everyone also that joined online our event. And uh, I'm, uh, you know, uh, I would have loved to have everyone here. It was impossible, uh, but thanks anyway to everyone. And please, for the people that are here, please stay because we have a little reception outside with uh, also the birthday cake and some refreshments that I'm sure you all will need now. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you.
Good afternoon. My name is Denny Horsag. I'm Vice President of Czech uh, Association for Circular Economy. I just received a forecast from Czech Meteorological Service for Prague for Thursday, 22nd of September. Sunny, no rain, plus 18 degrees breeze. I, I would like to warmly invite you for this conference, which we organize jointly with FEAS, with Ministry of Industry and Environment of Czech Republic. Our Prime Minister promised me to, to participate as well in the conference. I would like to share with you our experience from the East Europe, but mainly we would like to find a solution for the targets which, uh, which Green Deal and Circle Enemy bring to us. 22nd of September, sunny, no rain, plus 18 breeze. Thank you.